Uh, any question that you want to ask um, is acceptable. If we don't want to answer it, we will lie, I suppose. <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, um, I, I think all questions are uh, acceptable to us. I understand you're working on a new book. When, what is it about and when is it due out? I'm working on a book right now. It's been on, on it for a couple of years, more than that. About five years? Four years. Uh, no, no, two. Uh, it's modeled on the Merck Index, which I'm sure many of you know of. I'm calling it the, and the name of the book will be probably the Psychedelic Index. And it is a collection of information on compounds that are known to be psychedelic, uh, or have been explored to as if they might be psychedelic, but have, the activity has not yet been found, uh, or they have not been explored at all, but they have a structure that is very seductive and might very well be, the compound might be psychedelic. And each of these compounds is in the book uh, with its uh, structure, an outline of the published syntheses, physical properties, and biochemical properties, and pharmacological properties, and the um, legal status. And within these individual compounds, there are collections of analogs and homologs and, and uh, uh, isomers. Each of these compounds uh, is, in, th in other words, completely described. And um, every single statement of description has a literature reference attached to it. Therefore, it's completely documented Currently, there are approximately 2,000 compounds in the book, and I estimate the book would probably be around 1,500 to 2,000 pages. And I hope to have it in the condition ready for proofreading and typesetting by the middle of the year. Good. <laughs> if the anecdotal material is in the literature, it's in there and it's cited. If it's anecdotal and it's not documented, it's not documentable, it's not in there. Is there really a really agonists at the 5-HT2A receptor that have no psychedelic effects whatsoever? Uh, what does it say about the uh, likely role of other neurotransmitter secondary messengers or proteins such as P11? And could P11 present a new target for non type psychedelics? Mm -hmm. Um, there seem to be um, agonists on the 5-HT receptor, which do not seem to have an active um, psychedelic, um, how to say, an active psychedelic um, 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 level. But um, the question maybe once again in English, because it, <laughs> it's been technically real. It seems that there are specific agonists at the 5-HT2A receptor that have no psychedelic effects whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Or no, no? Effect what does it say about the role of neurotransmitters, secondary messengers, and proteins? Well, I don't. I didn't. I didn't hear this aspect dealing with C11. Uh, C eleven. P eleven. P eleven. Oh, P eleven. Uh, let me let me uh, just more sort of generally answer the flavor of the question. There are, I'm sure, many compounds that are psychoactive that do not call upon that particular serotonin receptor site. And it's very possible that there's a quantitative aspect in which it is a very weak aspect of that receptor site, and it may take a large amount of the material, or proportionally large amount of material, to be psychoactive. And I see no reason but what a material might be psychoactive and have nothing to do with serotonin whatsoever. If I had this information to work with myself, and I came across it, I would use it as a thing to learn from, rather than try to explain. You mentioned a few years ago that you were working on a compound which had a crossover between LSD and MDMA and had an aphrodisiac component. Well, <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting question to go after. <laughs> I have compounds that have aspects of the MDMA in it that are indeed uh, have certain aspects of erotic uh, component. And fortunately, I have a very good working partner who can help uh, explain some of these subtleties. But the truth is, in working with new compounds, every new compound that you develop is a brand new individual. And you have to become familiar with it, and it has to become familiar with you. And as you get to know it, and it knows you more and more, then you can begin defining its pharmacological and its uh, valuable properties. To that specific question, I do not remember what I was talking about at the time. <laughs>
didn't write it down at the time. I mean, what, what's, uh, do you remember any, anything about uh, uh, the particular compound? Did you write it down a note? or? Oh, my. I can't remember. Did we have wine at lunch in Palenque? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Last year in March, I was lucky to buy some dozen doses of methylone in Amsterdam. And it was legal this time in the Netherlands. And my research in literature uh, showed me uh, an article you published several years ago about the keto homologues of MDMA. Uh, did you also do research on keto homologues of, for example, TMA2 or others? I have I have made the beta keto analogs of many of quite a few compounds, and have tasted most of them. To a large measure, the activity is in the same ballpark act level as the parent amphetamine. I got into the methylone thing from an argument on, ef on ephedrine, in that ephedrine is not, a, an, not an amphetamine, but a beta-hydroxy amphetamine. And uh, it has some stimulant properties, and I've often wondered if it goes into the uh, body and it metabolizes to the ketone, uh, from the hydroxy compound once in the brain. And perhaps the compounds that are amphetamines go into the brain and are oxidized to, to beta alcohols. Then on that basis, perhaps you had a ketone, which we get into the brain through the blood-brain barrier. Then in the brain, it might be reduced to the beta alcohol. Therefore, the thought was maybe both the amphetamine and the beta keto amphetamine might become the same compound in the brain. So it's logical to make the beta ketone analogs of the amphetamines and see if they have the same properties. And to quite a measure, they do. Did you also taste the beta ketone MMDA? I don't specifically remember. I, I cannot tell you. We have researched about um, analogs, literally <coughs> analogs of MDA, which were tested in mice. What's, um, what's their action in humans? Or, uh, well, these substances tested in humans? I, could you tell me the question in English again? Maybe you can ask oh, it again. About MD, MMDA in mice? No. Um, Tetralin analogs of MDA, which were tested in mice. You published it um, a few years ago, I think. I, MDA. MDA. Uh, I did do some work with mice some years ago, and I abandoned all, all work with rats and mice, I'm afraid. Because I've been able only from mice to determine how toxic something is to mice. And I've had no insight from mouse response what an activity might be in man. Because the action in man deals with the mind and not with the brain. And so I end up with an inventory of dead mice, but no more knowledge of how it's going to act in man. So I've abandoned mouse experiments. You're not getting any questions. Okay. okay. <laughs> Do you currently have a relationship with the DEA? And if you don't, in light of what's going on with MDMA currently, would you like to get back into the game? Uh, what particular game are you asking about? Uh, a relationship with... Uh, I mean, he has never stopped working. What's going on with MDMA now? With the research and with Rick Doblin? I was wondering if you felt that it would be beneficial to that particular uh, deal to be more active than you are if you're not active at all now. Um, I'll, I'll give a quick answer before he answers. Uh, uh, his and our relationship with the DEA is, um, how should we say, sort of a polite avoidance uh, on both sides. And um, uh, MDMA has being the focus of a great deal of uh, press attention. Um, everyone wants to know about ecstasy, which is uh, one of our favorite words to hate. Because uh, the, the term ecstasy has no meaning. Uh, it, an ecstasy pill might have MDMA, it might have a third MDMA, it may have no MDMA. Uh, but as long as it's called ecstasy, uh, the authorities blame MDMA for whatever happens. I, I think our relationship the two of us with the DEA is pretty soundly defined that they go their way and I go mine.
Oh, uh, yeah. The DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, has its own world. I have my own world, and the worlds are quite far apart. Uh, my main interest is, is devising, developing, and, ex and uh, expanding on new drugs. Uh, their uh, primary ambition, uh, ambition is to take drugs and make them illegal. And at the moment, I'm staying comfortably four years ahead of them. <laughs> the moment is there. Angenehme vier Jahre. Um, does, does the desire to alter, to alter consciousness um, change in becoming, or in aging, and becoming older? Question, your question was, uh, does the desire to alter consciousness change with aging? Yeah. No. No, not at all. <laughs> I do have a question of my own, since I also paid the entrance fee, I think I should be able to do that. <laughs> um, I was becoming aware that you, um, in your book, uh, Tikal, you wrote in the entrance of psilocybin that um, certainly not the sparkle of LSD, and this is something that I experienced myself, that um, there is, seems to be an integral um, difference between um, psilocybin, mushrooms, and LSD. Um, basically, the state they produce is pretty much the same, but I think with LSD, um, the reflection, the reflective level is much more more enhanced and with mushrooms there is a much more dreamy state in which I did not seem to be able to have as many insights as I did with LSD. I quickly repeat this in German. Um, maybe it's just, a, <laughs> just for me. Uh, my approach to that kind of a definition or description is that every single psychedelic drug that I have explored is different from every other one. Every person I have met is different from the next one. Now some people will like certain other people other, more than other, other people. <laughs> and in and, and the same light, uh, not everybody is going to see a, a psilocybin or LSD in the same way that the other people would see those two drugs. So each drug is to each individual a unique and a personal interaction. Uh, specifically along that line, talking of psilocybin, uh, I have found that the acetyl ester of the corresponding phenol is very much like psilocybin in its action. And I've made uh, perhaps a half a dozen or a dozen ac four acetyl homologs of psilocin. And some are very nice, some are very interesting, some are dull. They are all different, but they are all interesting, yes. Any way to extend the duration of the experience of 5-methoxy-DMT? Well, 5-methoxy-DMT is not orally active. And uh, therefore, the activity has to come either from injection or smoking, or taking it with a material that inhibits its metabolic destruction. And as with DMT, 5-methoxy-DMT is natural in the human body. And therefore, you do not tend to build up a tolerance to it, or a blocking of further action. That, that means that you can take and have the material as an experiment, and then at a, another two hours later, have the same amount and get just about the same response. And if you get that same response and do not build the tolerance, the body has a way of, in essence, handling and taking care of its uh, being given 5-methoxy-DMT. And since, since the human mind is, the human body is capable of taking care of additional amount of material, I doubt if there's a way of extending its action. Namely, it is in there, the body recognizes it and takes care of it in its own way. So in general, I don't think there's a way of extending its action. I, I will add one, one caveat to that, in that I know of one person in a study that I was involved with, with 5-methoxy-DMT, who had about a three or four hour experience with it, which is much longer than any other, any, anybody else had. And so there may be individual variations that would uh, be real, but I don't know the answer why. Ever since I read, uh, I think it was Tikal, you were talking about being in South America, visiting somewhere, and the, um, the maid that was working for you, or, or working for the house there, she uh, took some of the MDMA, and she was pregnant, right? Reading about that was, um, you mentioned that you were watching Dune on television that night, 
And in the novel, Dune, by Frank Herbert, the witch Jessica, Ben Jesuit witch, took a, um, I guess it was a psychedelic, while she was pregnant and it affected her child. So ever since, in a good way, I guess, I mean, I made her a kind of a freak, but she was a very important person. Anyway, um, ever since I read that, I've always wondered, did you, um, did you realize that was part of the story of Dune when you wrote that in your book, or what, did you realize it later, or? Uh, no, I think you're talking about the spice. Whoops. Uh, yes. What they call the spice in yes. Dune. Uh, I didn't realize that, but I would, um, I, I was, uh, we were both very, very uh, impressed by uh, her story. And uh, we were, I think, a little worried that she was uh, eight months pregnant and had taken the MDMA. But uh, I think that uh, uh, the consensus uh, is that uh, it is during the first three months that it is most important not to take any drug at all. Uh, and uh, I think both Sasha and I feel that during a pregnancy, uh, one should avoid all drugs. But, but in this case, I gather we left before she had her baby, but we heard it was a, a fine, healthy baby. In this case, although they were sick before the child was born, they heard that it was healthy and well and that there was nothing wrong in this case. Nichts passiert ist. Oh, he, Sasha is definitely on the record for avoiding drugs. Everyone knows that. I just thought it was really fascinating that the same night that this happened, that you were watching this story, of, or this movie of Dune, and that was kind of a subplot of that movie, and that was so synchronous that it struck me very ho um, powerfully. Uh, the, the, the truth is, we were not watching Dune. Oh. The people in the household were watching oh, okay. Dune. <laughs> uh, it, it was in Portuguese, so... <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Of course, it's, it's generally accepted that, that, that it's not good to use any form of antigens or indeed many medications of any kind whilst pregnant. However, you know, there is perhaps an epigenetic effect for the, that may be residual in this, both prior to that and, and indeed after, during pregnancy, not all effects of, of, of epigenetic effects possibly uh, would necessarily have an ill effect. After all, evolu evolution of mind and, and beingness itself mm -hmm. must occur in this fashion. Um, what, what I feel about that is that, that uh, it is best always uh, to be extremely extra cautious when you're pregnant, and it is best to take only drugs that are uh, given to you uh, for good reason by your physician, period. No so exceptions. Uh, I could add one thing to this uh, in a funny way, not a sad way, uh, in that taking a, a mother just before she gives birth, taking an illegal drug, uh, can cause her to lose the baby in another way. In, that in the United States, in our progress toward an integrated country, uh, if a woman gives birth to a child and the child contains some of that illegal drug, the mother can be tried for giving an illegal drug to a baby and go to prison. And since the baby is not in prison with her, she has lost the baby. It's cruel and inhuman, but it is real. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sasha, but I, I, if you don't mind one second, if I may just say thank you very much for that. I fully agree, but I was trying to refer to what perhaps is the potential effect of our, our use of experiences that are prior and pass on in general, in general genetically perhaps to our offspring or from events far prior to pregnancy and nothing to do with, with what we're adjusting whilst we're going on. I mean, how, what kind of effect do you think this actually works with? Die Frage Expansion ist, of mind, possibly. <laughs> oh, the, if, I understand, if I understand the question, is that prior, in early pregnancy, there, what is the term called? Uh, the first trimester. 
the first trimester, but there is a period of time that's not known exactly when that time is the sensitive time that there's a change in the embryonic development in which the, the child-to-be is extremely sensitive to any change in its uh, dietary intake. It's about, about the, somewhere around the second month. Uh, I think that your question uh, has to do with uh, a drug use before the pregnancy begins. Oh. And um, I, that would, I would think that that would depend upon how long uh, a particular drug remains in the system. Um, I, I think that if you are going to be worried about psychedelic drugs having such an effect on uh, a later pregnancy, you would have to be just as concerned with uh, legal over-the-counter uh, drugs uh, that are taken. There, there's another uh, connection that might be considered, that sometimes with a psychedelic drug there is an aspect of romantic attraction, which if realized in a rational way, might lead to pregnancy. <laughs> Hi. I would... I read that you made an experiment with a columnar cactus, supposedly uh, psychoactive, called Pachycereus prinkle. And I would like to know if this is true and if you have any, had any, any positive results with the cactus. What was uh, the name of the compound? Pa Pachycereus pringlei. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, I have done some work with the cactus uh, Pachycereus pringlei. Close. <laughs> uh, it's a cactus that is uh, native on the Baja California, about halfway down the east coast. It grows native in the area, it was used by natives about several hundred years ago at the time the Spanish conquest came in. And the natives uh, culturally were abandoned, they went north and had an entire disappearance of their old culture. But they left behind cave paintings that were incredible. And in some of the cave paintings, there are pictures of gods in this holding their hands toward heaven in this way. And a very good friend of mine, this is downtown in Molohu, uh, a very good friend of mine saw these and realized that the cactus growing there had their hands up in the same way too. And he wondered if perhaps the natives saw the cactus as being gods or being gods in the form of a cactus. And so being a diligent experimenter, he went out and chopped off little bits of the cactus, boiled it up in water with a little lemon juice, and drank it. And it was extraordinarily psychedelic. <laughs> so he brought it north, and we looked at it and uh, tried it out also. The 12 of us, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and indeed it was. But the fascinating thing is the cactus had no trace of mescaline in it. It had no, known, no compound in it that was known to be psychoactive. I spent some effort with it and have characterized about 20, 20 compounds and identified about seven, uh, of which about three of the major ones I synthesized. They are what are called isoquinolins, and none of them are active. And so I am of the, there are some phenethylamines present also, and none of them are known to be active. So I have come to the conclusion that it may very well be an inactive phenethylamine is in the cactus, it is inactive because it's metabolized by the body very rapidly. But some of the isoquinolins are monamine oxidase inhibitors. And therefore, neither the phenethylamine nor the isoquinolin alone are active. But in combination, you have activity because one, not being active, blocks the body's metabolism of the other. So you have the counterpart of ayahuasca, where you have an orally inactive uh, DMT and a pharmacologically, psychologically inactive uh, carboline in combination, you have an active plant. So I'm looking at the uh, Pachycereus pringlei from the point of view of being an active cactus and perhaps having two or more compounds that are only active if taken in concert. I don't have any more answer right now than that. <laughs> I was wondering if you could shed your light on, on um, the extent to which you've mm, perceived differences in, in the, the workings of, of chemicals. Uh, given differences in the way they were, um, or in, uh, given differences in the way the raw materials were uh, grown, handled, um, the, the mentality with which these, these uh, the, the raw materials are 
I don't know, stored, combined, etc. In other words, how does how do the the, 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 how does the mentality in, in, in the, um, the handling of the, the raw material and the process influence the, 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 the psychological, I don't know, uh, effect? Uh, does the question deal with synthetic compounds and the person is the chemist, or does it deal with natural compounds and the person is the botanist? <laughs> I, I'm curious. What, I, I, I is it about question. chemical compounds or is it about plants? I, I'll, I'll clarify. Um, for example, if um, in, in the manufacture of LSD, and forgive me, I'm not a chemist, but um, w does it make a difference in the quality of, of LSD if you go through the, uh, the um, um, if you grow uh, mutacorn and, and you, yeah. you get er ergotamine and you go the organic route and you, you know, I don't know, you, um, for example, if you put planting your seasonal and, and all that sort of stuff, or you take a, um, a something and you synthesize it com completely from from some machinal process, I, I, you know, does does the the psychological effect differ from one way to another? I think I understand the question. Namely, does the handling, the source, the maker of the chemical, the isolator of the chemical from the thing influence the action of the chemical? If that's the question, the answer is very simple. The material DMT, for example, I think was specifically mentioned, mm -hmm. is identical if adequately purified, whether it's made synthetically in the laboratory or whether it's isolated from a plant. There she is no difference in its pharmacology. If it's made by a sloppy or an uh, indifferent chemist, or it's isolated from a plant by a person who's not particularly careful or diligent about purification, the pharmacology can be radically different. But a pure compound from whatever source is the same as a pure compound from whatever mm. other source. On the other hand, um, I have to uh, remind um, everyone here that uh, I have uh, come across people who had taken a compound that they uh, believed or knew had been made by Sasha. And... Um, uh, the, the idea that it had been created by Sasha uh, apparently influenced the effect, as far as they were concerned. It was much better than the same compound made by anybody else. So I, uh, so I would say suggestion sometimes uh, has a very strong effect. <laughs> when I make compounds in the laboratory, I always keep good classical music on the radio. <laughs> You made a lot of compounds during your work, and the question to you too is for me, what is the most important compound for you, Anne, and what is the most important compound for you, Sasha? In, as far as my own point of view, uh, to me the most important compound is a compound I'm currently exploring and trying to find the activity of. With one or two minor exceptions, I do not repeat compounds I know to be active uh, despite their having very interesting activity. I like to keep my liver relatively clean so I can explore new things and find new activity. So really to me the most interesting compound is the ones I'm currently working with. Not, means that may not be true with them. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say um, that the next compound is the most important. <laughs> <laughs> bit to say uh, or to ask if uh, not which is the most interesting but which might be your favorite child <laughs> <laughs> that's comparable yes yes <laughs> actually I do have some favorites but um, um, I think the diplomatic answer is the next compound <laughs> <laughs> Um, when taking MDMA, um, there has to be um, there has be been observed that there is some the jaw jaw gnawing, and the question is if um, there's a Swiss um, psychologist Samuel Widmer, who um, who said that this would be because of the inner tensions of a person, not because of the compound. And the question is um, if this could be true, or if uh, your experience has told you something different, maybe. Well, to me, I, I when I was exploring MDMA, I always had the jaw clenching and also had a sort of a lateral eye nystagmus. And these were, were two of the side effects that were quite consistent. And I, this is why when I would, would have another person using MDMA as an experiment, uh, never let them drive while their eyes are still not totally stable. 
And the simplest solution to the jaw clenching is to give them a damp wash rag and let the teeth rest on the, on the, uh, on the wash rag and go on with yeah. the uh, experiment. Yeah. But the, these two side effects are quite common. A lot of psychedelics have visual effects. A lot of psychedelics have a lot of uh, audio mm -hmm. uh, effects. Um, do you know, do you have any experience about uh, olfactory effects, effects on the sense of smell, please? Mm -hmm. The only, uh, I can think of only the one effect on smell that I'm aware of, and this is the enhancement of, of smells, of just in general sense of the enhancement of the senses. Uh, I remember one of my very early experiments with a close analog of mescaline. I saw a, a flower sitting on my, on my coffee bench, and it was an extraordinarily enhanced color and texture and smell. The smell was strongly enhanced. The interesting extension of that is another very close analog, which I subsequently synthesized. Uh, I was very curious as what was inside the flower. The first flower with the, the mescaline, very close mescaline compound, I had to hold in reverence and, and really almost thought it was God-given. The second compound, I had very similar smells, but I was curious where they came from and I tore the flower apart, which told me that these may both be psychedelics, but they influence your behavior in quite a different way. So I, that, from that I learned to respect one, my attitude toward the sense of vision, sense of smell, the sense of texture, because mm -hmm. very much strongly be uh, modified in its expression by which drug it happens to be. And one little suffix to this is uh, having worked about 60 years in a chemical laboratory, about the last 10 years I have lost my sense of smell. But my, it, it was a loss, but it was a very interesting 50 years with it. <laughs> well, I, I can do a lot of the smelling for him. Sie kann vieles der Riecharbeiten für ihn übernehmen. That's a personal thing. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, anyway. The, the girl, yeah. yeah. Best setting for MDMA. Set and setting. Set and setting. Also. Um, the people who, who go to raves and uh, take MDMA would say the best set and setting is um, uh, to be with friends and, and uh, with dance music, etc. Um, it, it's a, a, a personal choice. Uh, uh, before, before we knew um, that a repeated use of MDMA uh, causes the effect to drop off, um, I took it uh, once a week for about uh, a little over a year. And for me, it was my writing drug. And, uh, writing. Yeah. Uh, and I wrote, this is before... MDMA was illegal. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I took it uh, because it, it opened up uh, the parts of me that were creative. Uh, so instead of a dance floor, for me, it was uh, a quiet room and uh, my computer. So it, it depends on the person. Oh, excuse me, I should add that uh, due to this uh, overuse, which I now know is overuse of MDMA, um, I cannot get any effect from MDMA. Um, I don't know whether it's going to be forever or not, but I suspect so. But you have no effect at all? Depress a depressant effect. Uh, Mike, please. The dosage, uh, I went from 125 milligrams with um, a 40 milligram uh, supplement uh, to at uh, a year and a half about um, 250 milligrams uh, with a 100 milligram supplement, at which point my writing uh, on PCAL was done. Um, <laughs> Good work. And I decided that that meant uh, that dosage level meant I should stop entirely, uh, which uh, which I did for several years.
But interestingly, incidentally, there has been no cross a loss of sensitivity to new materials. No. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but now, um, when the question is asked at colleges or universities uh, about how often one can take MDMA, uh, after pointing out that uh, it's, it's difficult to be sure that you have real MDMA, um, I tell people that more, more often than four times a year is a mistake. So at least uh, I learned something of use to other people. Do you consider this uh, to be a rule for all substances or exclusively for MDMA? This seems to be specifically uh, an MDMA effect. And uh, uh, most people uh, discover after using it maybe every month or something like that, they ask why does the effect seem to be hard to find again? An interesting addition to this, a paper appeared, I believe in the Journal of Addictive Drugs, it appeared just this, this, uh, this month, as a matter of fact, in which a report was made by a group of people, I believe it was in England, of a patient they had who had taken 41,000 pills of MDMA. And they said this evidence of uh, both mental and uh, physical deterioration from MDMA. But in reading the paper, it turns out he had been using heroin, cocaine, alcohol, and a number of other drugs in the same incredible abusive volume. But the, the goal was to condemn MDMA, and that was the only word that was used in the title. So there is a touch of politics in the scientific literature. <laughs> <laughs> this gentle person recommends uh, Christmas Eve as the ideal setting for taking MDMA. <laughs> Christmas Eve <laughs> as the ideal setting. Depends on your vision to Christmas, I think. <laughs> Are you aware of any... Sorry, it's his, it's his turn here on the front. And huge is a racemic fixture, which is a fixture of stereo isomers. If for medical use or psychiatric use, which isomer would you recommend? Uh, the, the isomers. Uh, 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 I presume these are the optical isomers that were being talked about. Uh, I have explored both the, uh, the R and the S isomer. And uh, my conclusion, uh, the R isomer is more potent than the S. And yet, in my bottom line conclusion, is that neither the R nor the S is as good as the racemate. Uh, it doesn't make much sense, but that is, that's what I observed. <laughs> but definitely the R isomer is the more potent. Oh, das R isomer is definitiv potenter als das S isomer. Yeah, it's the girl. Okay, so m m my question is not uh, about chemistry. I just wanted to know um, uh, if, you, if you could say what what is your most uh, meaningful or deepest insight you, you had um, um, using psychedelics? I mean, or, uh, spiritual insight, uh, uh, philosophical insight, or something like that? I think one of the most dramatic experiences I had, I was on the East Coast traveling, and I used it when I was visiting uh, some people I knew. The compound I was exploring at the time was 2CE. And it's one of the situations where I can mix myself into so social environment with a little bit stoned and get away with it. And this time I couldn't. Uh, because what I happened is the material I thought would be like a normal psychedelic, which very often for me lets me give ideas or explore questions that I find interesting. But if I don't particularly care to answer the question, I can go on to another question. 2CE would not allow me to drop the question unanswered. And for about three or four hours, I had to split from the friends I was with and go into a quiet room and come to an answer to the question that I was trying to avoid. And I was rewarded by being asked another question, which I could not avoid without answering. A totally exhausting but fascinating four hours. <laughs> that was the most, that was a very remarkable experience. 2CE is a fascinating compound. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, I would like to ask, what is your favorite uh, set and setting for a, uh, for a session with psilocybin? I think that uh, for Sasha and, and uh, me, for psilocybin or for any other good material, our favorite setting is our bedroom. <laughs> and just as being a pleasant place to listen to music. <laughs> Uh, if do you have some funny story from MDMA session, if it's possible to say in the public, from um, your story? Um, the the most meaningful uh, MDMA sessions uh, for me were during a time I was uh, acting as a lay therapist and uh, uh, ex exploring the dark side uh, of people who uh, wish to evolve uh, their spiritual life. Uh, MDMA is, is an extraordinary compound for therapy or for um, <coughs> increasing one's awareness of oneself and the components of one's own psyche. <coughs> and each person, each client, uh, is completely different. It's co a complete planet and universe uh, all by itself. So these, uh, these experiences that, that the client is going through, especially when they are trying to uh, confront their own, what Jung calls the shadow, uh, this is some of the, the most terrifying work that a human being can go through. And when they come through it, when they have confronted their shadow and begin to understand it, uh, the feeling uh, that I have had uh, is uh, of having watched uh, um, and participated in a real miracle. And I put as much as I could of that kind of experience in the second book. I'm interested in, in working with uh, people that are approaching death, and I'm wondering if there are any substances that help those that help some people realize that they are more than their physical body, because the people that don't realize that are the ones that are so afraid. Um, I believe that, that Huxley, uh, when he was dying, uh, wanted to have uh, LSD. I, I think uh, it would depend upon uh, the, the response of the individual person to different psychedelics. Um, for myself, I would not choose LSD because it is uh, a great the drug, but it is not uh, my ally as much as mescaline. So it, it would depend on, on the person. Um, what do you think about the fact that um, speakers in this event are mostly uh, men and also uh, visitors? Well, it's it's very interesting, but. I, I don't. I don't think it is uh, that important. Um, I, I, I could point out uh, that uh, there are no speakers who are Native American, and there are no speakers who are um, uh, black, mm -hmm. and um, there are other missing uh, people too. And uh, some of the the potentially best speakers um, are not going to uh, be open in public about their use of uh, these drugs. Uh, they are probably professionals and uh, they have too much to lose uh, if uh, the information is misused. So the only answer to that is uh, to repeal uh, most of the drug laws. <laughs> According to, okay, I'm having a question. According to MDMA, you said you used it in therapy. I just hear that you, when you're taking after that you had MDMA, you're taking 2CB to fix the experiences. To fix it. 
Uh, yes, uh, 2CB, after uh, MDMA in a, a therapeutic session, um, never, never use them together. But uh, I did quite a few sessions with MDMA first, followed by a, a not very high amount of 2CB. And the only disadvantage is that it makes a very long therapeutic day. But the MDMA serves as an opener, uh, a way of opening the doors inside. And the 2CB, which is a true psychedelic, um, releases the emotions and the archetypes. Uh, so it, it is a very exhausting uh, experience, but uh, it can be extraordinarily effective. This, this gentleman here, yeah. Uh, the question is if an, an ingestion of um, tryptophan might lead to a metabolization into a form of DMT in the body, maybe if ingested together with harmaline, and this to an amount that you can have in psychedelic experience. Well, tryptophan itself will not be active in a mental sense unless there is a specific vehicle for transporting it across the blood-brain barrier. With a few exceptions, amino acids just do not go into the brain as such without a, a transport ally. So if you're using a tryptophan derivative as a precursor to a tryptamine derivative, it would probably have to be metabolized to that tryptamine before it's psychoactive. So to me, it's simpler chemistry to start with the tryptamine than with the tryptophan. Tryptophan, tryptophan, there. <laughs> <laughs> Main thing's trip. Yeah. Gentlemen, over the corner there. Uh, the question is if uh, DOB can be used in uh, psychotherapy, and if not, if this might be because of its length, and what's its toxic level? Uh, DOB is a fascinating compound, I'll grant that to begin with. Uh, DOB is extremely long-lived psychedelic. It's a situation of using a chemical and 24, 24 hours later you're still aware of its action. And as such, I don't think it'd be a, 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 the right timing for a, a therapeutic application. Uh, the, uh, there is an interesting point about uh, DOB, though, I discovered some 30, 40 years ago. And that is, uh, we were playing around in the, in the Lawrence Radiation Lab, uh, where we had access to cyclotrons and all kinds of beautiful equipment. And this is back in the marvelous days when the, there was rationality in the academic world. And they said, play with whatever you want. Just when you go, be sure the machines are turned off and the outside door is locked. And, and so we made a DOB labeled with bromine-77 and with bromine-82, the radioactive uh, materials, and uh, had the, the pleasure of injecting them intravenously because the amounts we used were a very small amount. And lying on a gamma detector, we could run the person over, we were the people, <laughs> over the detector, and on the oscilloscope would appear a scan of the body. And we found, to our surprise, the first organ, uh, once you intravenously, we had some liver there, but primarily the interesting, the target organ was not the brain, but the lung. And the lung built up a sizable amount of radioactivity with almost none in the brain. So we, we were f toying with the humorous possibility that the mind is located in the lung. <laughs> But it uh, didn't work out that way. With the patients, we found that once it had began dropping a level in the lung, the level in the mind started climbing. Oh, well, I'll the, see brain. Yeah. the brain. Oh. Sorry, the mind, the yeah. brain. And this, I think, is the reason it is so slow, long-lived, is very slow coming on. Mm -hmm. It goes to the lung and then is metabolized to something that then goes to the brain. And the radioactivity level of the brain never got too high. It's a very potent compound, but it lasted for quite a long while. I never did work out what the chemical metabolite was. I knew it was not bromide ion, because I kept collecting urine samples and there was no bromide ion in the urine. But I never did find out what the metabolite is. Clearly, DOB is metabolized to something fascinating by the lung, and that is the fascinating active compound, and I don't know what it is. Um, the question was, um, um, if alcohol together used with DOB, um, I think after there was done an alcohol test and it showed no alcohol. And the question was if DOB could somehow um, uh, decrease the level of alcohol in the blood, maybe, or something. Uh, what alcohol? Ethanol, what alcohol? 
<laughs> beer, whiskey, whatever. Well, I think, if you took, I think if you took alcohol without DOB and waited a while, you'd have no alcohol. It'd be a matter of timing. I, I don't know the answer. I don't think there should be a... Almost nothing influences the met metabolic dis dis disposal of alcohol, so I suspect there's no connection. I'm not at all sure I would want the two and me at the same time, no, though. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and to, to finish off what, what you were asking about the, the therapeutic use, um, I think it, that would mean a, a whole weekend of therapy. I think that would be a, a little too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not too practical. Excuse me, if I change the subject a little bit. Uh, do you have any experiences with ADD without hyperactivity? And if yes, do you know about substances which are used in therapy? Is it A E A D D? A D D. Oh, uh, uh, attention deficit disorder. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Attention deficit syndrome. Uh. Uh, I don't. I don't think there have been any studies. Uh, you mean uh, use of psychedelics uh, with ADD? I'm not aware of uh, any studies made of that kind. If one were to use a psychedelic as a substitute for uh, uh, whatever is being used clinically, Ritalin, Ritalin, or that type of thing, uh, you would have achieved one thing that I think is remarkable and that is to achieve a, a clinical use for a psychedelic. And, and with our current uh, uh, anathema uh, disregard of the possible clinical use of psychedelics, I don't think this is going to be very soon seen. But that, but that experience you related about the, the drug that insisted on having the question answered might be an antithesis to ADD. That'd be an inter interesting thing to explore. I, do, I don't know, but it'd be a... Yeah. Uh, that was 2CE. 2CE was the yeah. compound. That's uh, interesting. 2CE is not an amphetamine, no. It's a phenethylamine. It's a disorder. Uh, the Monroe tapes, um, the brain synchronization from the Monroe Institute, they've been using that for 40 years, and they found it to be very successful. And it's a non-drug. Mm. So it's just using sound therapy. Mm. Awesome. Sound. Ah, okay, um, one question concerning this, the setting, when you um, test a new substance, um, I guess you have some expectations uh, with uh, all your knowledge what the substance might be like. How do you, do you can you differentiate between uh, what is, uh, from your, what you experience, um, your, exp your expectation and what is, uh, uh, how do you eliminate the placebo effects in your um, trials? If I, if I understand the question, is how you in, in initiate the exploring of a new compound and not put a prejudicial bias on what you're yep. looking for. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I do this primarily by acknowledging that a new compound has, I've never met it before and it's never met me before. And I don't know if it's going to be a psychedelic or a convulsant or a cause long-term amnesia. I do not know. So I approach the stranger with extraordinary caution. And the, the simple mathematics is that if a very small amount is an appropriate amount to start with of an unknown, it takes no very small amount of additional material to start with one thousandth that amount of material. And so I start at a level that I am confident will not have any activity. And if it is going to be active, I have no knowledge of what this stranger is going to have in the way of activity. I do not like to be surprised by unexpected types of activity. And so I come up in very small increments. In very low levels, I will double every maybe three or four or five days. And I often will run two or three materials at the same, uh, on sequential days to have different materials in me. Uh, when you do find some sort of a clue of something that might be active, what usually happens to me is I get a, a feeling, oh, something like hair is rising on my, the back of my neck. Ooh, this may be an active level. That's you good. This, yeah. At which point I drop down to a smaller increase with each experimental level and space them further apart. Because there are things such as convulsants that also at low levels give you the same 
thrill of hair rising on the back of your neck. And I do not wish to discover new, psych new uh, convulsions. And I have uncovered a couple of uh, seizure drugs. So I keep phenobarbital at hand, which is a very excellent anticonvulsant. <clears throat> An interesting way, if you are ever in the edge of a what might be a convulsive uh, intoxication, there, there's a psychological process to follow that I have found in both cases to be very valuable. Just never complete a thought. It's like, like marching across a bridge. If you think something to its conclusion, you may have your seizure. So nine-tenths of the way to your conclusion, change the question and search another question out. Just never complete a thought and keep moving in different ways with a thought process with no consummation of thought, and I've never had a consummation of seizure. And in about 20 minutes, the phenobarb has taken control. And I've had, no, I've had no problems in that direction. But that early glow of a convulsant and the early glow of an active psychedelic are very hard to distinguish between each other. Um, but needless to say, I, I do not pursue the, the former. Go to another <laughs> material. <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you any method to remember the ideas coming to you during the trip? To, oh, okay. mm -hmm. Ideas. I don't know. Is there a way of uh, remembering the ideas um, that come to you? Yeah, uh, if you're asking, is there a way uh, to remember uh, ideas that come to you? Yes, uh, we keep notes. <laughs> um, in an interesting extension on that is the fact that a true psychedelic does not give you a period of amnesia. Right. Yeah. Whereas many materials that are called hallucinogenics or ha give you hallucinations often are lost in a fuzzy amnesia state. Mm -hmm. There are a number uh, of chemicals, copolamine-like things, that will give you fantastic visions, but you do not, don't remember them. I had a very good friend, a, a psychiatrist, who very much wanted to try scopolamine. And uh, with scopolamine, which is a, a, a hallucinogen in its own rights, but it is uh, blessed with a total amnesia of what goes on. In one point, I was his babysitter for this experiment, uh, he always was scopolamine, try a tenth of a dose to make sure he's not hypersensitive to it, then a full dosage, which is a couple, three milligrams. At one point, he was walking across the living room and walked into a door on the far side of the living room, which he thought was open. And uh, when I talked to him at that point, I asked, why did you walk to, into the door? And he said, I thought she was a very attractive girl who had gone through there. <laughs> Complete amnesia of the fact that he'd never remembered any of this later. And in this particular case, I, at the time I was in Berkeley, uh, I made the mistake of letting him drive home after he had been, slept, had been sleeping for uh, several hours. And he drove across the San Francisco Bay Bridge, and as he was driving across the bridge, he, one of his medical students, uh, one of his medical, medical school allies was sitting in the front seat next to him. And every time he turned to talk to him, the fellow would get into the back seat of the car. And every time he'd look in the backseat of the car, the fellow would disappear. So he turned on the radio, uh, turned the radio, uh, playing some girl singer, I forget who it was. Uh, anyway, a very, he had all of her records, but he did not have that record. Yeah. And, and so he t wanted to turn up the volume toward the end of the record to find out what the record was. Yeah, Betsy Smith, yes. Betsy. Betsy Smith. And he found the radio had not been on. So there was a smell of hallucination still going on. And very wisely, he got off the bridge on the far side in San Francisco and took a taxi home. So I got this whole story from him, and I asked him later, how long did it take him to come to a normal place? To which his response I thought was fascinating. He said, how do you know? <laughs> so the case of an of a, of a amnesia is a very treacherous thing to work with in these materials because you must have a babysitter and... And when you have this aspect of amnesia as a property of the drug, I get rid of the drug.